Hi, I'm Nick, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how to transfer tokens from one Solana wallet to another. We're gonna use the new JavaScript client called Gil, and let's dive into some code. So very similar to the previous video on how to actually mint tokens from a token mint and then also creating them, we showed that in the previous video, we're gonna transfer tokens. This functions the exact same way almost. Uh, we basically only have to swap out one single instruction. And also to note here is that we already have a token. We'll go back over to the Solana Explorer. We have this token called Super Sweet Token. It's on DevNet, it's not a real token. And it has this mint address called uh, HWX and it has a bunch of supply has been minted. This uh, is owned by a couple of random DevNet wallets uh, and we can actually transfer them from our signer wallet that we have and transfer it to any wallet that we want. And to note here is that the particular wallet, the signer I'm gonna use is this Nix 6 e This is my Solana CLI wallet. We have a bunch of tokens minted to it and we're gonna transfer them. We're gonna, we're gonna send them to another wallet. So I'll go ahead and uh, sort of save this mint address in here as well. So, cause this is what we're gonna need. And once we know the mint that we're gonna send to is we can start building our transaction. We can get our connection to the blockchain and actually build our transaction. So let's create a Solana client. And uh, since this token exists on DevNet, we're gonna go ahead and connect on DevNet. We're gonna get our RPC and our uh, send and confirm transaction. And then we can start building our transaction. Just like all the other times we've built these transactions, we're gonna call create transaction directly from the Gil SDK. And we can start passing in all this information. We need a key pair signer in order to actually sign this transaction. So let's go ahead and load in our key pair signer from our local file system. So load signer, oh, if I could type. Load signer from file. This is gonna get our default CLI key pair. So if I, uh, you can see here in my console, my address is nick6e, I have devnet sol, this UD is for devnet, and this is the address we're gonna load in. So we're gonna use that as our fee payer. Next up, we can set a transaction version. Uh, again, because we're not using address lookup tables in these examples, we don't need a version zero transaction, so we can use legacy. And then we can pass in an array of instructions and our latest block hash. But we don't have a latest block hash, so let's, let's get our latest block hash. Just like all the other examples, you know, as you start to do a lot of uh, Solana development, you recognize all these patterns as you're, you're doing the exact same things over and over and uh, getting a block hash is one of those things. So we're gonna destructure this and rename it to latest block hash, make it a little bit cleaner. And now we have our, our core base transaction. We, we're ready to actually tell this transaction what we wanna do. So what do we wanna do here? Much like when we created our tokens, when we minted our tokens, we had two instructions. We have our create associated token item potent instruction, and then we have our mint to. We're gonna use this exact same uh, create item potent instruction. And this is again, like sort of the gold standard for token operations on Solana, because the way this item potent instruction works, we'll go ahead and just copy and paste it in here. So the way that this creates associated token item potent instruction works, and this is, this is sort of the gold standard for interacting with tokens, if you're minting tokens or transferring tokens. And what this does is because of the way that tokens work on Solana, they have this associated token account model where a wallet, so the owner of tokens, actually owns an associated token account. And this is associated with a mint and a token program. And this is basically just how token ownership works on Solana. So when you issue tokens to a user or to a wallet, it's issued to their ATA, which is owned by their wallet. It's sort of this unique relationship. Uh, it has a lot of benefits and it's it's got some nuances around it. But what this item potent instruction here does is if the user already has their associated token account, the ATA already created, it's not gonna create it again, they already have it. So the transaction can be faster and cheaper. If they do not already have it, it will automatically create it for them. So the transaction is gonna be a little bit more expensive, uh, both in compute and in fees and rent, but they have to have this. So this is sort of the gold standard, sort of uh, think of this as like a graceful failure where if they have it, it's gonna continue on. If they don't have it, the ATA, it's gonna create it for them and then continue on. So we are gonna call this instruction and we need to get the ATA for our particular owner. The owner we're gonna have here uh, we're gonna go ahead and transfer it to a random address. 
And this address, um, I have this totally random address saved in another file from another script. I think this is just like a randomly generated one. I don't even know what this address is, but it doesn't matter because you can send them to any destination. So this is going to be our destination. We need to know what token program our mint was created with. Okay, close that. Our, this particular mint, this HWX was created on the legacy token program. So you need to know that and you need to use that correct token program. We're gonna derive our associated token address, which is basically uh, the actual address, again, that owns the tokens. And the way that you derive this, there's a helper function inside of Gil for it. You need to know the mint itself, the owner, so the destination for these tokens, and the token program itself. And you can just pass all those in, derive the ATA, and then we can create, we have all the information to create our instruction now. So now this transaction will create the ATA for the user if they don't already have it, and if they do, it's gonna exit uh, successfully. So now that we've created the ATA, the user has their, their destination for these tokens on our mint, or for our mint. Now we can actually um, transfer tokens to them. So we'll call get transfer instruction. And we can start passing in all the information that we need for this transfer instruction. We can pass in uh, the source itself now the source is actually gonna be the source ATA. So we're gonna go ahead and derive this uh, again. So the source ATA is because we're sending tokens from one wallet address to another. So we're gonna be sending from my CLI wallet, this nick 6 z to this 7S uh, address. The source is gonna be my local address itself. So I need this address. I'll go ahead and copy this in. So now that we have our source address, this is gonna be here. So that's all we have to change there. So now we have the source ATA. So we'll pass in the source ATA here. The authority is the actual uh, transfer authority for this particular token account. Because these tokens are owned by my signer here, um, I'm gonna pass in my signer.address as my authority. Oh, sorry, that should actually be the signer because this is required to sign this transaction because you have to authorize transfer from the source ATA to the destination ATA. And then we can pass in our destination is our ATA itself, the amount of tokens we wanna to transfer. So we will transfer, we'll say 1 million of these tokens, 1 million amount. And to note here, this amount is based on the uh, total decimal places for the tokens mint itself. So if we look at the source code for uh, when we created our token mint, you can see here we had decimal places of nine. So because we have nine decimal places, when we're actually transferring tokens, the decimal places are gonna be taken into account here. So nine decimal places, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So effectively, this transaction is gonna mint 0, 0.00, or rather transfer 0 0.001 of our tokens. Um, so that's how many tokens it's gonna be. The last thing we need is to know the token program that this is part of. So we're gonna pass in the program address, token program address. And there we go. These are the only two instructions that you need to actually transfer tokens. You need to create an ATA if the user, if the destination doesn't already have it. So that's gonna be our owner. And then you need to actually transfer from your source ATA authorized by the source ATA's authority. In this case, that's our signer. And then the destination ATA, so the, the ultimate end owner destination, total amount taking into account the decimal places, and then the correct token program that all of this token is owned by, is sort of managed by. This token mint was created um, using the legacy token program, that's this one here. So we need to make sure we pass that in. And I'm gonna go ahead and just take the lazy approach here. I'm gonna copy and paste this transaction sending. So we're gonna sign our transaction. We're gonna log out our Explorer link for it. And that way we can easily pull it up. And then we will go ahead and send the transaction to the blockchain itself. So clear our console. We'll run ES run. We'll use ES run to actually run the script. This one is called four dot token transfer. So we can run this. Transaction goes through. You can see it's uh, there's a little console hang here. That's because it's still processing the transaction. Uh, probably got a little bit of rate limit. Been sending a lot of DevNet transactions lately. So there we go. Now we've transferred tokens from 
our source account to our destination account. So we transferred from Nick6Z to that 7S wallet address. You can see our balances have changed. We had uh, both of these have the same token mint, the HW. We generated the ATAs, or rather we derived the ATAs for the source and the destination. We sent in, if you look at the transaction instructions themselves, we created the ATA using the idempotent instruction, and then we transferred from our uh, authority, signed it, Nick 6 e from our destination, or to our destination, from our source. So this was owned by Nick 6 e and this is owned by the destination wallet. Now we can continue to send this exact same uh, function here, call this exact same script to send uh, tokens from one wallet to the other. You know, we send it a whole bunch of times. And if we pop back over to the Explorer, you know, we can keep doing it unlimited times. You can notice that if we go ahead and refresh our mint, our mint itself isn't changing because we're not uh, creating new tokens. But if we look at the total balance of the owner that we were sending from, so the Nick 6Z, if we refresh this, you can see our balance has gone down and it just keeps slowly going down every time we send. We're only sending a, a very, very small amount, so it's not going down much. Uh, in this example, but you can send as many tokens as you want and you can keep sending those transactions. So much like I described in the previous two videos is this sort of has a lot of code. There's a lot of nuances you have to think about, but you don't have to if you don't want to. There is a transaction builder that Gil has. So we can call the build transfer token transaction and we can use the transaction builder to actually simplify all this information that we're sending. So we'll grab our common information, so our signer, our, our block hash, our transaction type. We can tell it the amount of tokens we wanna to send. We'll send the same amount as before. The authority is gonna be our signer and the destination is going to be the owner because that's where we're actually sending the tokens and then we need our mint. So now this uh, single transaction builder has the exact same functionality uh, it actually has a little bit more functionality than this previous one. So we can get rid of those. We can remove these imports because we don't need them anymore. The source address is going to be automatically derived. If you need to manually derive it though, you can pass it in the source ATA, um, but it will automatically derive it if for, for most cases. And then we can now remove these imports and we can remove this one. And now this entire script is a lot simpler. It's a lot cleaner, easier to read, and it has almost the exact same functionality. It actually has slightly more functionality. So if we send this transaction now, I'll show you how this is actually different. We'll go ahead and pull this up. And if we look at the previous transaction, we had two instructions. We, yeah, so we had two instructions here. We had the create item potent instruction, has a bunch of inner instructions because it did CPI. We have the token uh, transfer instruction and that's it. We have one and two instructions. If we look at the builder transaction that we used, it actually has more instructions. It automatically sets a compute unit limit and it automatically, and it does the exact same thing with our idempotent and our transfer. So it actually has three instructions inside of it. Because of the transaction builders that Gil has, they actually all ship a recommended default that's sort of a safe default for doing these types of operations to make it so your transactions are sort of default optimized, so you have a higher likelihood of them landing faster and being more successful. So that's gonna wrap it for this video. If you wanna learn any other things about using the new Solana JavaScript clients, leave it in the description and I'll catch you in the next one.